I'm Cheryl Smith Rogers. My husband James Hearn is is here with me tonight. Um, she mentioned a little bit of my background. I'm also a, a Texas Master Naturalist. Have been since 2012. Uh, we tend a uh, Texas Wildscapes demonstration site at our yard here in Blanco. We live on Ninth Street. We're very easy to find if you want to come see us. Um, so I guess that's it for that one. So the slide that my uh, program tonight. I'm starting out with a little quote here. Sometimes something itty bitty takes you on a giant adventure. And uh, Jupiter Joe said that. And that's what happened to me. So this is a very different program for me to give. So it's kind of like, um, well, you'll see what I'm talking about. <laughs> so my adventure, my itty bitty thing. Yeah, I don't want to get anybody's way. Um, started out with. Y'all know these, right? Wild grape hyphens, little grape hyphens bulbs, which of course are not native. I know that. So there was this lot, this vacant lot in Blanco, and the Trinity Lutheran Church owned it. And I knew that there, I had seen these uh, bulbs blooming, you know, I guess in the spring, purple. And I had heard, you know, how you do in a small town, you hear something's going to happen. And I knew this was going to be paved over, so I thought, well, you know, wouldn't it be nice to go out there and, and dig up some bulbs? So here's the here's Main Street here in Blanco. Here's the church. So here's the big area that where we'll be kind of focusing on where the bulbs were. So I did dig up a little pot of my own, and I took them home with permission. That was in April of 2018. And so come... October, well, they still hadn't done any work. And I guess maybe my foliage and my pot was green or something. It made me think about those bulbs again. It's like, oh, just the thought of the little bulbs underneath the pavement. It just kind of really bothered me. So I uh, called the associate pastor, Dana Leggett, and I said, hey, you know, y'all haven't paved out there yet. What about if we do a rescue? You know, what if we go out there with some of your, you know, church people and we'll dig up bulbs? She goes, yeah, I like that idea. So I went out um, one morning or one afternoon to kind of scope out the area to just to see where, you know, where the foliage was. So I, when people came, I could, you know, point it out to them. And, uh, and here's a little common buckeye down here because I'm always you know, on the lookout for whatever I can see. So when I was looking down on the ground, I did see this, this plant that I've never seen before. And I took pictures and, um, you know, went on my merry way, and we had the plant, the bulb rescue. That was Friday. It was chilly, as you can see, and we did a pretty good job of digging up these, you know, they're, they're tiny, these little bulbs. So we did um, manage to rescue quite a few of them. So now we're going to have a little backstory in the stock. So I have a, a blog that I started in 2008, and kind of as a gardening journal, um, what we planted and when, and then I started adding, you know, things that I observed and things that I learned. Well, then iNaturalist came around. Are anybody here familiar with iNaturalist? Have you heard of it? Well, I tried using it in 2015, and I just got frustrated, and I just, you know, forget that. So, but then the next year, they had this Texas pollinator bio blitz. And you go out for you know a certain amount of time and you take pictures, you know, and it gets to be kind of competitive. And I only take observations, that's what they call each, like if I see a butterfly and I take a picture, that's an observation, but I can take like 10 pictures, you know, of the same organism. So I do all my eye naturalist in our yard in Blanco, which is about an acre, because it's two lots plus our adjoining meadow. We have our vacant lot quote that we turn into a meadow. So anyway, that year I was number two. You know, I was like number two in, in species and I was number three in, in observation. And I was like, wow, you know, look at me. Well, then the next year, I mean, well, I'm sorry, that fall went to, you know, I created me a little bio and went to this uh, Master Naturalist conference and met up with, you're on iNaturalist, you know this guy. Sam Biology. He's an urban biologist up in Dallas, Fort Worth. In fact, he's going to be speaking at the Fall Symposium. This guy's great. I love Sam. He's, he lives and breathes eye naturalists, literally. So then the next year, 2017, I mean, look at me. I was number one in species, number three, you know, in the observations. I was, you know, I was rocking it. 
and uh, really getting into eye naturalists, really starting to use it and understand it better. So then the next year, though, I didn't do as good, but, you know, <laughs> I still did, you know, pretty well, but I wasn't up to the top five. So that was kind of the end of that for me. I thought somebody else can do that. So in the meantime, though, I kept using iNaturalist. And so I use it to document. Isn't this a beautiful beetle? I just found this, oh, a couple of weeks ago. It landed next to me on the driveway. It's like, oh, I don't have that one. And then here's a, a dragonfly. And so I use it for that, and I use it to maintain a species list for our yard. And I'm up to, actually, it's 1,098 it went down. I was so hoping to get it up to 1,100 for tonight. You know, I didn't I didn't make it, but I'm working on it. It was a big deal when I got to 1,000, you know, last year. Well, yeah. <laughs> and I told Jane, no, that, that, that wasn't going to happen. Isn't that a beautiful jumping spider? Change the subject. And then I use it to also other people that are on iNaturalist, you know, everybody joins in and you find things and it's like, what in the world is that? Well, it turned out to be a moth. So I use it for that. Okay, so now we're going to go back. That's, you know, back story. So the mystery plant, it's like, what is this? What is this? So I took sent pictures to a couple of people that I really, one was in our Master Naturalist chapter and another gentleman, he's in heaven now. And, and they were both perplexed. They, they wrote me back and they said, you know, I don't know. I just, I'm, I haven't ever seen this before. So two clues. I was still working on it, you know, in the leaf arrangement and, of course, the seed pods. And so the uh, leaf arrangement reminded me of the Alamo vine, which is the morning glory. But they're not the same, but there was just something there that kind of rang a bell with me. So I remember one night I sat in bed in my pajamas with my iPad with iNaturalist. And what I did was I went through all the morning glory species because that's a great um, um, ability of iNaturalist. You can search, you know, and you can like what I did is I plugged in morning glories and then Texas. So it would narrow down all the observations just to that. Um, area. So I went through all these morning glory pictures and I was looking, of course, for that leaf arrangement. And finally, that's when I came across the crested morning glory. And I thought, okay, I found the species, you know, that's growing in the, the vacant lot next to the church. And so I took some pictures. I don't know if any of y'all do this, but I submit sometimes images to the Lady Bird Johnson Wildflower Center and uh, for their database. And Joe Marcus is the one that kind of oversees all that. And so I sent him these images because they didn't have any that I could find. And so he wrote back and he's like, wow, you know, that's really interesting. Can you get any, um, you know, plants, seeds, any, you know, anything? So he was very excited about it. I was like, well, yeah, sure. So uh, I contacted Dana Leggett. She was the assistant pastor there at the time. She's the one I contacted about the great hyphenates. And so we went back. I guess that was like the next Friday or so. There's Dana. And has anybody met Manette Marr from the Wildfire Center? She came out. It was the first time I got to meet her. She's a plant conservationist. There she is. And it was chilly again that morning. So we're out there flagging all these, you know, vines. And there's quite a few of them. So we were staking them first. There's Dana and Manette. And I'm in the, the hood. And then James. James arrived. He's like, well, why don't we just pull up these plants? They're annuals, which is true. So we started bagging them, which made a lot more sense. And we were able to work faster especially since they were going to be, you know, paving over this property. So that's what we started doing. So we were out there a few hours working, you know, pulling up these plants with the seed pods. You can see the little seed pods down here. And there's Manette's crate of goods. And then I dug up one of the Crest Street Morning Glories to take home. And so Manette took the um, everything back to the Wildfire Center, and they processed. You know, they were uh, processing the seeds, and um, she took some live plants back too, I believe. I think those I can't remember if those were the roots as well. So there's all 
what was going on at the Wildflower Center, working on all those. And then she took some really nice shots. Uh, there's seed pods. There's the actual seeds and the little flower. They're very tiny little flowers. So then I returned several times myself. I think James might have gone out there a few times too because I kept thinking, oh, you know, there's still a lot more vines out there and, and uh, any all that we can get. I could just kept thinking this is going to be paid. Everything's going to be paid. You know, what can we say? What can we say? So I, you know, I put together a pretty good bag of seeds. And um, I guess I was pulling them up too, I'm sure. So more rescues. So I had, I observed some um, the foliage. I guess y'all seen the hill country lilies, rain lilies. Their their foliage is thicker than the other species, which is smaller, smaller flower and smaller leaves. And I asked Dana, you know, could we could we dig those up as well? They were further off, I mean, kind of the edge of the property there. So James, uh, I think maybe I did too. I dug up a. We have six right here, six of the big bulbs. So, so then, <laughs> come to find out, James said, this, this lily is in a boulder. And I said, oh, well, just go ahead and leave it. And, you know, that's too much work. Oh, no. He said, I'm not leaving this one behind. So he worked for a long time, and he got this. I mean, it was a big, about like that, big rock. With this rain lily growing in the middle of it, here it is in the wheelbarrow, and you can kind of see here. Um, it was amazing, just amazing. If you think about it, because they have those paper thin seeds, if you've seen the seeds. So I guess one of those seeds just washed into a crack in this boulder, and the rain lily's been growing in it, you know, all this time. And, and the size of those bulbs, you saw the bulbs. I don't know. I can't explain it. But we took all the bulbs home, and James uh, planted. We planted the bulbs here. And then you can see there's the boulder. <laughs> it's a corner of our garden. And I went out yesterday and took these little pictures because I did make – I have signs in our yard, you know, with the names of the plants. So here's Hill Country Rain Lilies, Trinity Lutheran, and then Lily and a Rock. It's over here somewhere. And they're all, I count them every spring, you know, at seven. And they're all there. They're all coming up and they're alive. So when I was out there one time, I, like I said, I just I just couldn't leave anybody behind. So there was this great big grasshopper. It was like, come on, you know, we're, we're going back to my street. That's about three or four blocks away, I guess. And then I found this mama wolf spider. But if any of y'all know anything about me you know I love spiders and that's another presentation that I give it's on spiders so there she is it's a wolf spider and she's carrying her egg sac in her spinneret I've already put her in a bag oh. to take home so the grasshopper rode on the dashboard <laughs> <laughs> and then I let him or her go in the meadow and uh, the spider I let her go out in our backyard and now I can say I knew your mama you know I see the little one for the probably about three generations ago so morning glories and I'm, I'm talking to native plant people here so y'all probably know the basics of uh, a lot of this but I just thought I'd throw this in you know the, the common characteristics of the morning glory family and you know they're usually vines and, they, and the flowers are very similarly shaped um and here in our area i know we have bindweed in our yard that, that grows naturally and the dwarf and the tie vine and i've seen this we saw this growing natively in the uh, guadalupe river state park and now we have we also have it we planted it that's another story because we planted it five years ago and it was gone and then i was in the yard and I saw this flower in a seed pod. It's like the Lindheimers came back. It was crazy. Beautiful plant. So then also when I was putting this program together, I didn't know it, but sweet potatoes, that's a morning glory. Did y'all know that? I didn't. I didn't know that. And Carolina Pony's foot, which is a ground cover native. It, we, it grows everywhere in our yard. That's a morning glory. And then I've never seen this. I've always heard about it. The, the parasitic daughter. And it's a morning glory. Um, 
Well, that's pretty amazing. So the mystery plant. So first I had identified it as the, the Crestwood Morning Glory, Ipamia Castellata. I'm still not, I'm not even good at botanical names. I'm trying to act like I am, but I'm not. Um, Manette is. She can say them. Um, this is somebody else in some pictures that I got off of my naturalist. But then Manette came along and she identified it as a variety of the uh, Crest Rib Morning Glory. So actually, Edwards Plateau Crest Rib Morning Glory. And these are Mr. O'Kinnon's images. He took them um, near Enchanted Rock. So Mr. O'Kinnon was actually the one, he and Mr. Newsom. In 2002, he wrote the description. This was a new variety back in 02 of Crestria, the Edwards Plateau. And so um, when all this kind of, all this attention, this was going on. Um, oh, I'm sorry. I'm a little ahead of myself right here. So the Crestria Morning Glory occurs largely, you know, down in Mexico and, and some into Texas. And it has... Uh, more variety in color of the flowers, whereas with the Edwards Plateau, this is an old slide. There's six uh, six counties here, and it's white. The flower is just white, which is true. This is what is what we had found was white. So the Edwards Plateau Crestry Morning Glory got its home page on the wildflower. Dot org uh, database in January. Joe got that done. Um, so I thought, well, that's real exciting because that happened because, you know, all this that was going on. Um, so then, and that's what I mean, it's, you just don't know. I found that little plant and then because of that, all this, you know, happened. So yeah, I got to have a field trip to um, the, the tower, UT. So have y'all been to a herbarium, or have you been to the UT herbarium, anybody? I never had. I'd never been to one before. And it's really, it's kind of, it, um, it's housed in the center, kind of the core of the tower. So it's not real exciting or anything, but it's just, it's cool. So the, uh, it's called the Billy L. Turner Plant Resources Center. And there's actually two herbariums. Um, and Mr. George, see, I can't even, I'm not even trying to last name. And he, he's very serious. He's really a nice guy. <laughs> he loves his job. You can't really tell it there. But um, so, um, so the UT herbarium, the two, the two different herbariums, um, the UT's herbarium was started in the 1890s. The first specimens were deposited by their, their, bio, their first biology teacher in the 1890s. And then the Lundell, uh, herbarium that was donated in the 1980s by Cyrus Lundell, and his he had a collection of more than 450,000 specimens that he collected from Texas and Central America. And so, the, between these two, there's um, so our mission though, why we went there was to deposit our voucher, Manette created uh, this voucher of the Crestriod. Is it raining? Oh, wow. Well. Um, so I never, this is a first for me too. And James is, my name's on here, and Dana and James as, as the collectors. So I thought that was really nice of Manette. She didn't even put her name on it. She should have. Um, so that was our mission was to take that to deposit in the um, herbarium there. And so um, George likes to, you know, give people a tour and an introduction, which I talked a little bit about that. But also, uh, the collection also includes about 600 or so specimens that um, Ferdinand Lindheimer found in the 1850s around uh, New Braunfels. So that's pretty cool, too. I mean, these are old. Here's Lindheimer's Senna and Old Man's Beard. So then George, he will show you, if you go, two treasures. And so he shared these with us, and I took pictures, but I thought, you know, wouldn't it be cool to kind of learn about what, what's the story behind this 
um, voucher here, this specimen. So that's what I did is I did some research and I ended up telling George about it. He's like, oh, I didn't know that. So this, this uh, voucher was collected um, during the first voyage of the Endeavor, Captain Cook. I'm going to try to do this without looking at my notes, but I do have notes because there's a lot of uh, dates. And so Captain Cook had three voyages, but this is on the first one from 1768 to, to 71. And the, the uh, mission of, the, of this trip was to view the transit of Venus, which um, that occurs every 120 or so years in pairs. There's the first one, and then eight years later is the second one. And it's when Venus passes as a little shadow in front of the sun. And they wanted to observe that so they could make calculations and figure out how far the Earth is away from the sun. And so they weren't able to do that because of the, uh, okay, what's it called? Black drop effects, where the two, anyway, they kind of touch it. It just didn't work out. And so they weren't really able to get those measurements until the 19th century with photography. And then last night I had to look up the last transit of Venus occurred in 2012. So I just learned that. And the next one will be in 2117. So I don't think we'll be around for that. But anyway, so that was the reason why they were on the, you know, to, to go on this expedition. And the secret mission was to search for the fabled um, southern continent. But what they ended up doing was discovering and mapping New Zealand. So there was a wealthy landowner and botanist by the name of Sir Joseph Banks. And he was a, a leading scientist at this time. And he helped to fund this trip. And so he had a friend who was a botanist, a Swedish botanist. And his name was. Um, Daniel Solander. So when Mr. Daniel heard that um, Sir Joseph was going to take this trip, he goes, oh, wouldn't you like to have a companion, a traveling companion? And Sir Joseph said, well, sure, okay. And so they also uh, took along a young man, uh, Sidney Parkinson, who was a botanical artist. And so about midway, so they started out, oh, when was it? When did I say that the ship took off in um, 1768? So in November of that year, they stopped in Rio de Janeiro because Captain Cook needed supplies. But the viceroy of uh, Rio de Janeiro, he was very suspicious of a British ship in the harbor. And so he staged a guard on board the ship to keep, make sure everybody would stay. You know, he didn't want anybody getting off the ship. Well, Sir Banks wasn't too happy about that because, of course, his his whole thing was he wanted to collect plants. That's what he was, you know, doing. And so what he did was he devised a plan. And so late, I guess after dark or whenever, he and Mr. Daniel and Mr. Sidney, they all went out through a hole or like a window or a poor hole, I guess, down a rope and into a boat. Don't ask me. I don't know where the boat came from. But they got into the boat and they took the tide up to shore and then rowed in. And after dark, they went in, you know, into the land and, and collected. So that's how they got this, this, um, uh, whatever, you, you, uh, porium. Yeah, you, porium. That's how they got that. They, they escaped off the ship and went after dark and, and brought back all these plants. And so, and here's Solander's writing here, uh, this gentleman. And so um, Captain Cook did get his supplies and the expedition continued. But sorry to say, Mr. Parkinson did die of dysentery uh, a few years later. So it didn't end so well with him. But I just thought, how interesting is that? You know, that's how that uh, specimen got to be. So the other one that George will show you is this right here. It's actually a piece um, that was given to... Uh, Dr. Lundell, Cyrus Lundell, from the director of the Royal Botanic Gardens. And if you look, it was cut from this voucher, which is in their collection with the Royal Botanic Gardens. This one, you can find this online. That's what I did. And so this was um, actually collected by Charles Darwin. And the story behind that is that um, 
So this was aboard the Beagle, and that trip was to have lasted two years, but it actually lasted five. And so Charles Darwin at the time, in, um, I guess 1831, he was 22. He wanted to be a naturalist, and his father had expectations of him being a clergyman. But he was asked to go on this trip um, aboard the Beagle to be a naturalist and to uh, study ge uh, geology. And so his father reluctantly agreed and let him go um, and paid his expenses as well. So while on this trip, they spent about five weeks in the uh, Galapagos Islands off of South America. And it's there that they believe that uh, his book is really well a uh, well-known book on the origin of species. That's where that came from. And so he was uh, there for oh, several days, and that's where he collected um, this specimen. And here's what I, the closest I could find is it's this tree right here. And they have a big statue there on, now it's called uh, St. Cristobal. Um, for Charles Darwin. So anyway, that's the story behind if you go and you show, he shows you that uh, specimen. That's the story behind that. So, so then he'll take you around and show you all the sealed cabinets to keep the bugs out and to keep the temperatures the same. And everything's filed by family, um, you know, genus, species. It's pretty interesting. So our, our uh, crest rib morning glory was going to join other crest ribs. And then later on, one of my master naturalist uh, friends told me that when she went there to tour, George shared our, our uh, voucher with her group. So that's pretty cool. So anyway, from there, Lynn, uh, Lynette and I, we went back to the Wildflower Center. Have you, most of y'all been to the Wildflower Center there in Austin? Such a cool place. Oh, y'all need to go. And so she took me kind of behind the scenes and, you know, saw the seed processing cabinet. And, they, and they're, I guess they're always got volunteers in there working on seeds processing. There's some pictures. And then she also created a voucher for our crest rib that will go into the wildflowers herbarium, too. So she made two. So the seeds that we collected. They'll be used in the gardens um, and uh, landowners. And I actually, uh, I do have crisp rib seeds that I brought tonight. I've got enough to give seven people or seven couples, if anyone, because this species does occur in Gillespie County. So uh, stick around and, and I'll give you, I've got about 10 seeds and, and envelopes. If you'd like some, I'll be glad to share. So they were able to process can you believe it? 1,372 seeds from what we collected that fall. That's been 2018 now. It's getting further and further away. So what happened next? I got I wrote an article for the Wildflower uh, magazine. That was my first and, and only so far. And kind of tells the story what I'm telling tonight, much shorter. Um, in the, in the uh, vine that I planted after we rescued it, um, it we had a really nice crop in, in the summer of 2019. I got some seeds. It's a really neat little vine. You can see the white flower. And then some of my seed pods have these little grubs in them. And even like yesterday or the day before, this has to be an older version of this little guy. And they create a, I guess they get in, there's just like a little pinhole. And that's where they eat and grow. And, and I've tried putting some in a jar because I'd sure like to know what it turns into. I'm, I'm thinking maybe a beetle, but I'm not sure. So then I found this, uh, if anybody's interested in taking a screenshot or something, it's a uh, database where you can plug in um, your species and if you're trying to figure out what's eating one of your plants. So just a little extra there. And so, oh, and then I was able, I, that's when I put this uh, presentation together um, for the State Master Naturalist Conference in 2019. So that was my first time to give this program. So finally, 
So first, yeah, a little a little bad news. So there's the the vacant lot, and it did get. I think it got officially paved just this past few months or so. Yeah, uh, but the good news is that the Edwards Plateau Morning Glory it became its own species. It's not a variety anymore because when Mr. Newsom, I'm sorry, when Mr. O'Kinnon heard about all this, it got him on a stick because I think he'd started writing a paper to describe this uh, vine as its own species. And he got it published in 2019. And so now the Ipomoea edwardsensis, am I saying it wrong? Okay, okay good. <laughs> It still doesn't have, it hasn't, I don't think Joe Marcus has had time to change it on the wildfire.org yet. It's still listed as a variety there. But um, I thought that's pretty cool. And I love it to be, I, I was so happy to be able to include this in my presentation. But now it's its own species. Well, I got invited to the plant conservation conference in Fort Worth, but thanks to COVID, that didn't work out. <laughs> Um, and last year we didn't have any uh, crest rib. I was pretty sad about that. So. But this year, I think with all the rains that we had and there were seeds in the ground, and so it's coming back. And oh my goodness, it's I let it go this year. And we have have y'all seen narrow leaf four o'clocks, which is a native species, and it was growing along our fence line there on Green Lawn, and, and it got into our backyard and. You talk about reseeder. It, it, this this little guy has grown into the barberry. We planted barberry, and all over the the narrowly four o'clock, and it's gone crazy. So that's how I've been able. I go out there and you know pick off those little seeds to try so I could bring some to y'all tonight. So all this just goes to show that Juniper Joe's right. Something sometimes something itty bitty can take you on a giant adventure. <laughs> so, anyway, that's it. Don't y'all want to know who Juniper Joe is? <laughs> Juniper Joe Waters, I wrote a children's chapter book, and the main character, her name is Juniper Joe, and she finds a magic plant on the playground, and it's a sensitive plant. You know, the little pink, the, uh, what do they call it? Yeah, the little pink powder puff, and you touch them, and then they close up. And so, yeah, so that's Juniper Joe. So, 